Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the next exciting panel session. Please join us online and here on stage in our room here at München Brigerit in Stockholm. Welcome back again from the coffee break. I'm happy to address and welcome you to our next panel, which is about addressing the climate crisis and protecting the future of democracy. Another important angle. And for that, we have another exciting panel lined up for you this afternoon. And I'm pleased to introduce you to Kevin Casa Samora from International IDEA here in Stockholm. He will lead us through this afternoon discussion. He's the moderator of the next panel. And uh, welcome on stage. Thank you. Somebody, should I sit here? Yes, All right. Please take your seats. Warm welcome again. Good. All right. <laughs> Stay alone. You have to sit over there. <laughs> You have to move closer. Or something. <laughs> you can, you can, you're fit. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, you'll be comfortable with that. <laughs> well, good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. And uh, let me just welcome to this, uh, to this session those of you who are following this forum virtually. And let me say from the outset that I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be moderating this, this session, which is a session jointly convened by CIPRI and by International IDEA. I happen to be the Secretary General of International IDEA. I'm Kevin Casasamora. Um, and it's wonderful to be having this discussion to bring attention to two sets of issues that have been kept apart for the longest time, despite the fact that they are both crucial to our future. In effectively addressing the climate crisis and protecting the future of democracy are two vital agendas for our future. On the one hand, the outcome of the climate crisis will depend on whether democracies can drastically reduce their carbon footprints in the short to medium term as democracies generate over 50% of emissions of greenhouse gases. On the other hand, the future of democracy as a credible political system may well ride in its ability to effectively deal with an existential issue for humankind. The question is, what is it to be done to enhance the ability of democratic systems to respond to the climate crisis? Namely, how to leverage the assets that democracy brings to the table to address climate-related security issues and, at the same time, how to mitigate the shortcomings that often affect the performance of democratic systems. So this panel, I hope, will pay particular attention to how democracies can better listen to and absorb proposals, participation, suggestions, voices from young civil society actors. Joining our conversation today is a truly wonderful panel. First, I have the honor of introducing Mr. Magnus Nilsson, the State Secretary to the Swedish Minister for Foreign Affairs, Anne Linde. With climate and security, democracy, human rights, and the feminist foreign policy among his areas of responsibility, previously he has served as political advisor to the Prime Minister with responsibility for climate issues as well as chief political advisor to Minister Linde. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Secretary Nielsen. Uh, now I have the distinct honor of <laughs> introducing Mr. Felipe Calderon, 
the former president of Mexico from 2006 to 2012. President Calderón presided during his term over the successful UN climate conference in Cancun in 2010 and saw the passing of a comprehensive climate change act in 2012. President Calderón chairs the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate and is honorary chair of the Green Growth Action Alliance. He's also the president of the Sustainable Human Development Foundation and a member of the board of directors of the World Resources Institute. Thank you for being here. President Thank you very Calderon. much. Thank you. I also have the pressure of introducing Ms. Ili Nadia Zulfakar, the co-founder and chairperson of Clima Action Malaysia, a grassroots climate justice and feminist non-governmental organization led by young people. As you have heard in the spotlight presentation Nadia gave just before this panel, she mobilizes civil society for climate justice, seeks to enhance climate literacy for good governance and empowers vulnerable groups. She's also a climate policy consultant and a researcher at several think tanks like ISIS, Malaysia, <coughs> the European Climate Foundation, and the Inca Young Leaders Forum. Thank you for being here, Nadia. It's wonderful to have you. And last but not least, I have the honor of introducing Ms. Nasrim El Saim, a Sudanese youth climate activist and climate negotiator. She is on the UN's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change after a nomination by the Pan African Climate Justice Alliance. Nasreen is also the president of the Sudan Youth for Climate Change and was an organizer of the 2019 Youth Climate Summit. It's great to have you here, Nasreen. Thank you. So we're going to proceed like this. Speakers will have five minutes uh, to deliver their opening remarks uh, in response to a question that I will pose to them. Uh, and then we'll have an exchange of views among the, among the panelists, and then we'll open it up to the public. So let's dive into this. Secretary Nielsen, it is not random that the Greta Thunberg phenomenon of mobilizing people around the world to act on climate change started in a place like Sweden. What specific practices, processes, institutions allow climate activists to be heard in a place like Sweden? What strengths, given the evidence uh, provided by the Swedish case, what strengths do democracies bring to the table in dealing with climate change and related security risks? And what do you think are the weaknesses that need to be mitigated? Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is, a, like you said, very interesting and important discussion, which I look forward to. Uh, it's going to be nice to hear some of these voices as well. Uh, I want to start by just saying that, just to be clear, that Greta Thunberg is not on any, in any way a result of Sweden in that sense. I mean, uh, Greta and uh, the movement she uh, uh, she's a part of, Fridays for Future, is of course a strong movement which on the, in their own ambition and their collective efforts have made this Im very impressive work that they have done possible. So this is not something I can take credit for or anyone else in Sweden. This is their work, and I want to be clear on that. But with that said, of course, from a Swedish perspective, we are uh, very proud of our, both institutionally speaking, our strong defense for freedom of speech, our strong uh, defense for um, the right to demonstrate, the right to assembly, and um, uh, the this, this support that this uh, collects in the Swedish society. So this, of course, part which made such a movement possible. I also think that an important part is the historical uh, issues from a Swedish perspective. We have, we have a history of strong uh, unions, we have a history of strong uh, democracy movements, we have a history of strong uh, different civil society actors working together for democracy, which spans at least a hundred years back and longer than that. So I think 
organizing in a way is part almost of the Swedish DNA, I would hope. Uh, I read some once that there is 10 million uh, civil society organizations in Sweden, which is impressive in a country of nine. So I guess it's... <laughs> Um, it, it, we have a history and we have a tendency to organize in a way that I'm proud of, uh, which I hope is important as well for future <coughs> movements to be able to pick up um, these different uh, challenges that we see globally. Then from a government point of view, of course, there are some things that we've done to try to support this. We have um, a youth council that was formed in 2020 uh, to support the work and support the voices of young people going towards the Stockholm Plus 50 conference, which is going to be held in 10 days from now, I think we're starting, so beginning of June, uh, climate conference. So uh, this was, of course, a way to gather and have the young, uh, pe uh, young people's voices heard also in this context. And we also have civil society consultations for the Agenda 2030, which is also a way to um, organize young people, but mostly to make their voices heard. And I think this is an important part of it. Sometimes it almost sounds like young people should be included just because, uh, just because. And I believe it's important that the voices and the ideas of this youth council is actually implemented into policy. That the voices are not only something you hear from panels or something you hear from debates, but actually something that politicians listen to, includes and makes policy from. And I believe this is an important part as well about why we're going to get into that more later, but why is democracy the most efficient way, which I would argue, to tackle climate change? I think this is because democracies have the um, courage to listen to voices when they speak about things that are on the horizon. And I think especially young people usually see what's on the horizon before anyone else. So I think the possibility to actually see what are the threats, what are the possibilities, what are the options we can see in the future is something that uh, democracies can pick up on. And I would say that uh, non-democracies or authoritarian states have a built-in tendency to uh, remain at status quo. Change is always a danger. Change is something that could uh, challenge. It's dangerous. While democracy has the opposite tendency, which I believe is an important part of why democracy is key to fighting climate change or any other global threat at a large scale which, can, uh, which is presented to it. So I, I truly believe this is... We're going to come into the weaknesses as well, which you asked already, and of course some people tend to say that democracy is too slow, we have to have the climate change, it's happening now, we should have started decades ago, we're running late, the changes needed cannot be passed through parliaments, through governments, through civil societies, through academia, it must happen now, now, now. To that I would argue that I believe it's, even if we're in a rush, we need to get it done right. These matters uh, of climate is, of course, enormously complex matters, mm -hmm. which includes a lot of different aspects, not only climate, but the environment in different aspects. And I believe that only society is strong enough to <coughs> take in this information and make it into sustainable policy that works over time and includes different interests and different conflicts within society is a democratic society. So I believe that this is uh, not only fundamental but necessary. Doing it fast may, may mean making it wrong. So I think that this, uh, that many people say slow effect of democracy might be actually necessary to get it right. So that would be my first take on Thank this. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, one, one initial reaction would be I, I 
happen to agree with you in the sense that democracies have the potential and the inclination to listen to people. A, a lot of people would ask, are they listening? Which is, I think, is a, is a, valid, is a valid question. We'll, we'll get to that in the course of the discussion. President Caldera, during your presidency, you gave a lot of priority to a competitive economy, but also to sustainable development and effective democracy. Climate issues, I know this for a fact, were and remain very close to your heart in this context. And you devoted a, a, an exceptional amount of attention to them. How do we ensure that democracies embrace decarbonization policies? That they create social consensus around them so that climate justice can be better protected? And how do we do all this at the speed necessary for human survival? And I'm asking you this in a, you know, in a very, uh, I guess, in a very uh, candid way, as a, as, a, as, a, as a former politician. I mean, what are the incentives for you to embrace this sort of cause? Uh, amidst the constraints posed by democratic institutions? Well, first of all, thank you for <coughs> inviting me today. And honestly, I, let me try to avoid a, a boring session t t this afternoon. But I believe that democracy has a lot of bad incentives regarding climate. The look at this, what is happening right now with, with, with uh, energy prices everywhere. And one of the key elements to tackle climate change and to reduce carbon emission is to withdraw any subsidies in energy, gasoline, and so on. And with these prices, a lot of democracies, a lot of governments in democracy are absolutely tempted to subsidize fossil fuels. So to be honest, it is not straightforward that democracy will provide the best elements to be responsible with the environment. So going to the question, in my case, I need to say that well, I learned from my father since I was a child. My father was very older when, when I was born, 51 years old when I was born, almost my grandfather. But he, has a, he, has a, he, he was a utopian and a visionary. He was very conscious about this movement 50 years ago, uh, talking about the Stockholm Plus 50. And he started to talk in the 70s about uh, melting poles and snow, climate change, acid rain, and most of the, his friends believed that he was absolutely crazy, uh, losing his mind due to his age. But the point is, I learned from my father, and I started to have a real um, conscious, and I got a purpose, a sense of purpose in my own life, that uh, the moral duty with the country related with democracy to build democracy in a very authoritarian regime th those times, but also a real commitment with the environment. So the answer is the first and the boldest point to act from the government in a democracy or not democracy is the own principles and beliefs and commitments of the government, of the ruler, either president, prime minister, or whatever. It's the most important thing. And the problem comes <coughs> when who is governing has not such principles in a democracy, or there are a lot of the, 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 the vested interests of the perverse incentives appear in the way they are appearing today. Again, now the gasoline in Mexico is again being subsidized, and a lot of money is going to subsidize fossil fuels. Oil companies are subsidized with taxpayers' money. So we are exactly backwards because who is commanding the nation has not commitment or even is a skeptical related to climate change. So what democracy can do in order to retake the lead and retake the road we are losing? I'm talking about Mexico, but it could be the case in any country, especially developed or developing countries, mainly developing due to the poverty and necessities. Where there is when democracy needs to take action using the balances 
that democracy must have. So and those balances are either in the branches of the power, the legislative or judicial system, and it's quite interesting that uh, very much of the movements on NGOs in, in Sweden and other parts of the world are taking to the courts several mm -hmm. elections in order to force the government to take action on climate. That's, a, is, that's, a, that's one way to use the equilibrium and the balances in the government. Or the legislative branches pushing the congressmen and congresswomen to take action as well. But in order to do that, it is absolutely needed to win the battle of democracy, which is elections. And we need to mobilize voters to pick, to select representatives of governments that are absolutely committed with climate change, absolutely committed with the environment. Unfortunately, my generation and older generations, and even younger generations, because becoming very old, suddenly very fast. <laughs> uh, my generation and others are the politicians, yes, just don't like to talk about it. The politicians just consider that being responsible is absolutely inconvenient in political terms. If you raise the price of gasoline or allow the market works in that sense and withdraw subsidies, you will lose a lot of votes. If you take responsibility in the environment, protecting uh, natural area, uh, you are going to lose opportunities and economic growth. And we need to battle against a false dilemma, Kevin. What is the false dilemma? My generation and other generations learn that we need to face a dilemma in the sense that we need to pick between economic growth or climate responsibility. That need we to pick between creating jobs, some alleviation, alleviating poverty, or tackle climate change and being responsible for natural resources. And the key issue for democ in democracy to get the governments in the right track is to build the right narrative. And the way is we need to demonstrate that that is not a dilemma, or better say, it's a false dilemma. That yes, it is possible to create jobs and have poverty alleviation and to have economic growth. And at the same time, and maybe the only way to do so is being responsible with the environment and tackling climate change, embracing the new climate economy. Because creating jobs or fostering renewable energy, for instance, implies to create jobs everywhere, the new jobs we need everywhere. In the United States, for instance, in the speech of the message of the former president, Donald Trump, protecting vested interests or protecting uh, fossil fuels interests, the coal mining workers, for instance, uh, he was arguing in favor of 82,000 workers. And yes, he was right protecting them. But we need to say that only in solar in the United States were created almost 300,000 new jobs in the last 10 years. So the new economy is there. And yes, we need to design a fair transition for all those coal workers, mining workers, but also to, to say the new narrative to put in track the politicians and the voters, the voters looking for politicians that are responsible with the environment. So we need first, again, I'm sorry we take too much time, but we need to have the principles. We need to have the convictions. We need to be aware as politicians, as a government, that we need to act responsibly. And second, when such thing doesn't happen, and it's happening very often in democracy, we need to mobilize people, resources, voters, public opinion, to build the right narrative and to push the voters to pick the right politicians to be in the Congress, in the Parliament, in the government. There is no other way to do so. And let me say, not always being radical, preaching, lecturing everyone is the best solution to that. Roughly, my learning as a politician is very few times fears mobilize people and both. Fears or punishment or the horrible description of hell mobilize people. It's much better, so if you are preaching and lecturing everyone about how responsible you are and you need to act this and that way and you are an ugly people because you did, I don't know what you did, and, but did or not, not all would work. It is important to build a successful narrative to talk about the benefits of paradise, the benefits of promised land of a responsible planet with environment instead of the hell or apocalypse thing, which is the most 
radicals, uh, environmentalists used to do all the time and always have very few chances to win in politics. Thank you, President. Thank you. I'm just wondering, and again, material for the uh, future discussion, I'm just wondering if those political incentives are changing precisely as a result of the activism of young people. Uh, you know, I see many countries where dealing in, a, in, an, in an active and a proactive way with climate issues is a, is a, is a vote winner among uh, younger generations. And here is where our next speaker, Nadia, comes in. What recommendations do you have for democracies better to listen to and absorb proposals by young civil society actors like yourself? I think um, the first thing that comes into my mind is definitely building safe spaces and platforms for young people to participate in where their ideas are not being stunted or intimidated. So we must safeguard, uh, for example, uh, in, in, the, in education institution, uh, students' rights, that is absolutely critical. Um, education institution must be free from fossil fuel investments that is critical to protect the integrity and independence. Why I say this? Because the education institution is where, is where those ideas grow. And if we are stunted, if we are still limited within the fossil fuel um, kind of mindset, and like uh, Mr. President, you have mentioned this kind of narrative, then we cannot move forward then we will be forever sitting in the same cycle talking about how we can um, do growth in an inf infinitely, it's, it's impossible. So it's, it's really important to make sure that our education system, education institutions are free from fossil fuel investments. Um, certainly, um, Recently, I had a talk with uh, a really inspiring uh, filmmaker from Canada, I think. So it's important for us to not restrict the uh, creative power of young people. So when she comes in, she told me um, she's doing uh, a, a documentary, you know, a type of storytelling to tell stories about how to uh, simplify complex issues. So this is the power of young people using all these different tools that we have right now. And, and we have to protect this kind of creative power. And um, we have to be as diverse as possible. Um, and, and by restricting those energy, those creative energy forces, we will come up with a really singular way of how to solve things. And this is, I think, um, what a loss, really. So, and of course, um, the workplace. So we know that the young people are entering the workforce. They will be the actors. They will be the people who, who the driver of the economy of the country. So we need to protect workers' rights. I think in Malaysia, in countries in the global south, we know that trade unions are very rare and they do not work. So we must empower trade unions so that the people who enters the workforce has the ability to rethink new ways, new innovations, um, without, uh, being, without uh, having restrictions of um, decent wages and etc. So it starts from there where young people are entering these different points in, in contributing to the country, to the nation. And of course, um, we have to keep communications open, I think, between the young people and the government. Often we know that um, we have very different interests. Um, I think previously there was like a, a slight tension before, before this between the Fridays for Future activists with uh, the, the minister uh, from uh, Anlinda, I think. So we have to keep those communications open. In countries in Malaysia, we wouldn't have, we don't have those kind of platforms. The country only, only cherry picks who, you know, who fits the narrative of the current political party and etc. So. It's, it's not possible to work uh, in a way where it's very restrictive. So those kind of communication pathway must be open. Those communication channels must be open and to be inclusive. So I say this, I inclusive, uh, it's a really, 
uh, it's a really important word. You have to actively listen. You know, when you are inclusive, you have to actively listen and taking account of uh, young actors' feedback. And, and for this, you have to form partnerships. You know, by actively listening, you have to form partnership and not ownership. Because it's very common to see that uh, government takes the kind of narrative, they, they took youth as um, <coughs> tokens and mm. etc. So it's really important that youth are not being used as tokens. They must be, their, their leadership, the youth leadership must be protected at all costs and respected. And um, we need more avenues for young people, especially in Southeast Asia, where we have seen this rise in militarism, um, not only in Myanmar, and, and now we have the, the return of the dynasties in, in the Philippines, the militarism in Papua. Um, we need, um, young people to co-lead, to, to have um, co-lead in, in political parties, to co-lead ministries and to co-lead communities and co-lead education institution. Why I use the word co-lead is because we need those intergenerational transfer of knowledge and we can't, you, we can't just um, create something new, we have to create something um, from the basis of uh, you know, from the knowledge that we already have, so that cooperation and partnership is absolutely critical. Um, I think, of course, I already mentioned about decent wages for the young, and I think it's really important that um, we respect the voices of the young, that is absolutely critical. I think most people here have always uh, taken youth voices as, um, you know, not, not tokens, but, um, yeah, they, they are always there and, and people just took it for, for granted, really. So we must respect those voices. Yeah. Thank you, um, Nadia. Thank you. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just curious here, just to link it to something President Calderon said. Uh, my impression is that for a lot of young activists, there's a temptation to look into the political system from, from the outside, right? Mm -hmm. And do you detect, again, this is for future discussion in the panel, <laughs> but for, so that you start thinking about this, do you detect greater <coughs> willingness on the part of the younger generation to engage with the formal political process? I mean, to become party leaders, to become mm. party activists, to mm -hmm. go to, you know, and get elected into Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, because that might be an important part of this, of this puzzle, as, as President Calderon was, was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just wondering if there's, a, if there's a change in the attitude of young people towards the political process. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, I'll go to you, Nisreen. And I will, I will give you a very easy one to answer. You know, what needs to change in your view to make compatible, inclusive decision making and the building of broad based consensus around decarbonization with the speed to address the climate crisis? Because we all keep, you know, banging the drum correctly of greater inclusion and greater participation in this discussion, but there's the question of speed. I mean, we all know that the, the window of opportunity to, uh, to mitigate some of the worst aspects of this crisis is closing down fast. So how do we make compatible to the extent that they are compatible, greater inclusion with a sense of purpose? Um. <clears throat> You call this an easy question. <laughs> easy peasy. So he's asking me, how can we reach consensus, which is something that the UNFCCC, which is a whole UN institute, was working for 26 years and we're still not there, mm -hmm. into a decarbonization, which is something that the whole policies of the current world is working on, also unsuccessfully until now, 
and you think I have the answer for? No, I, I of course don't have the answer for that. And especially that you are asking about the speed or how fast yep. we can actually reach there. Um, but what I can answer for is what we actually need. And what we need is decarbonization um, in many matters. What I mean many matters is until now, carbon capture technologies is a science fiction. There is no carbon capture technology that's proven that it capture carbon. So we know for a fact that until now, continuing using fossil fuel will not lead us anyway. So what is the solution for that? We stop thinking about decarbonization or carbon capture. No, we still invest more and more in science and in technology trying to reach carbon capture technologies. But we cannot afford to continue emitting the same way because, as you mentioned, the window is closing very fast. So we, in the meanwhile, we also have to um, lower the emission. We need to use renewables and at the same time use the normal natural carbon sinks, which is basically trees and forests. And all of these processes have to go hand in hand together, otherwise we will lose a lot. Unfortunately, from what I see right now, there is no win-win situation for the current generation that we are living in. It's either we will pay a lot to get renewable energy, uh, invest a lot for reforestation, and also try to invest even more in decarbonization. But I am sure if we did all three at the same time, simultaneously, parallel, a generation will come, and this generation will have the privilege to actually use all sources of energies, even if we talked about fossil fuel, because then we will already have the carbon capture technology. But for this generation, we have to do it all. We still have to keep uh, reducing the emission, keep reforestating, and also keep uh, investing in carbon capture technologies. Um, regarding your question on the, the topic of today, which is protecting the future of democracy. Um, as a person coming from Sudan, <laughs> I have a very big question of what is democracy specifically. And, and in order to be honest with ourselves at the beginning, before going to others and talk to others, for a lot of people, especially in, for example, Europe or Western countries, democracy means that they elect people to represent them. That's the very basic understanding of democracy. So as a person who knows the benefits of myself, who's, uh, who am I going to elect? The person who says, well, unfortunately, because there is climate change, you will have to use heaters only two hours a day um, because heaters use a lot of energy. You will have to use public transportation because using your own car is a privilege. We cannot have it. You have to eat vegan food because meat consumes a lot of water and it emits a lot of methane, which is a, a greenhouse gas. Um, you have to do a long list of things that will make the person feel out of their privilege. Because currently we are in a, I have hundreds of lights in front of me and all of these having electricity is actually a privilege that people will lose if we actually reduce the emissions that we are having right now. So the question is, Am I going to elect the person who will tell me the truth that the world is dying and we need to reduce the emissions by reducing our privilege? Or I will vote to the person who will actually give me more promises by more privilege, even the world, if the world is going to die in 50 years or 20 years or 30 years? And this is the actual question that we all need to answer. Are we really, really ready to let our privilege go for the sake of environment, future generation and the planet? Or we are just raising our hands and having big, big signs of saying, yes, go green, without really knowing what are we going to lose. And I emphasize on lose because it's a privilege that we will lose if we actually transit it right now. That's very interesting. That's very, very interesting because what you're, one of the things, if I interpret correctly, that you're saying is that this discussion looks very different from the standpoint of a country in the global north than from the standpoint of a country in the global south. The discussion is different because the stakes 
in terms of losing the privileges of development are that much clearer in the global south. So the way in which the discussion that this debate is posed is, uh, is, is very different. I, I think, um, I'm sorry, but I think you didn't get my point. Many, many, yeah, many around. global south countries doesn't have privileges to lose in the first place. <laughs> so let's, let's keep them away. I am talking about decarbonization. We are talking about the countries that have a lot of emissions and they have a lot of privileges according to these emissions. For example, New York City is using three times the energy in one month that the whole Sudan is using in one year. Absolutely. Where all of this energy coming from? I'm sure it's not the sun. <laughs> this is the questions that we need to answer for. If we are really going to be realistic about the trajectories or how people are going to decarbonize, then we are going to ask ourselves, are the population who is practicing democracy are ready to elect people who actually tell them the truth that they need to cut their emissions this way or not? And I, I am sorry to bring this name here, but we had a clear, very clear picture when Americans elected Trump. He was a person who was saying that we have more factories, we need to have more workers, we want to have more emissions because we have more population that needs to work. And the climate denials are actually not people who deny that there's a climate change. They are just people who are not ready to live with the sequences of actually going green. Yeah, it's not about losing the privileges of development. It's about losing the prospects of development, exactly. which is different. That's exactly. That, yeah, that's and true. That would make the, the discussion different in the global south. Secretary Nielsen, you wanted to come in. No, I think it's very interesting to listen to these um, introductory remarks because for many it seems like having... Um, making negative decisions of people is very hard, and I would like to disagree. I would actually argue that democracy is, in theory, has a hard time making negative decisions, but in reality, it's actually pretty good at it. Not always. They fail, often, but they also succeed. I want to make an example. I studied at university in Gothenburg, the second largest city in Sweden. There used to be, when I studied there, a mayor, the late mayor of Göran Johansson, uh, and there used to be in Gothenburg a large shipyard industry, which was going downhill, uh, jobs were moving away, um, opportunities were going down, economy was going down. And in an interview, he was asked, uh, don't you fear these new machines that are taking everyone's jobs? And he said, I don't fear the old machine, uh, I don't fear the new machines, I fear the old machines. And he explained his vision for actually changing the city of Gothenburg from a shipyard city into something else. He was able to describe something which was very negative in the short run, a shipyard industry moving away, losing tens of thousands of jobs, and describing a future where there are other jobs and other possibilities. And I believe this is something that can be done with reshaping communities in every part of the world, because countries are different, Absolutely, but people are the same. You can argue in the same way, in no matter what context you're in from a democratic view, that in the short run there is a price, but in the long run we're all winners. And this is possible. It is possible, democracy has done it several times. And even though we sometimes take out examples of the leaders who have been populist leaders, showing, no, no, let's just not do that. It's easier to just do the same that we're doing today. We can just as easily find examples of politicians who put forward harsh truths, who put it forward in a rhetorically brilliant way, who's explained their vision for a better tomorrow, and people have voted for them, knowing, fully knowing, that they will lose in the short run, but they will win in the long run. So I, I think that democracy is actually quite capable of handling big issues, much larger than generations, but spanning lifetimes. It's hard, really hard, and it will fail and it will stumble on the way, but I'm positive that it's possible. President Kaluri, you wanted to come in, but you know, just to, um, 
to build on, on this last comment. I mean, you, you must have a few stories to tell about how is it that democracies deal with long-term issues? What do, you, well, honestly, what do you need to do? My reflection, my first reaction to what the secretary, I'm sorry for that, is, but uh, my first reaction is maybe that is related with the level of education and development of the countries. The more educated is the people and the generation, the more able to distinguish and appreciate and compare short term and long term. But honestly, in several countries where the people has not massive transportation means, where the people has no energy, where the people has no cars, where the people has no factories, the it is not straightforward for voters to say, well, I will sacrifice even more my own current situation in order to have a better future. More educated people, more educated societies, more mature democracies could do that, and not always works. But honestly, the problem we are facing in young democracies or unstable democracies or is populism, for instance, populism is using these short-term decisions, short-term expectations to defeat yep. any long-term vision everywhere. And that could be in countries in Africa or in the United States. Populism, it's appearing to offer short-term solutions, easy, brief solutions for problems that are long-term problems. Yes. And that's the key issue and that's the reason why these guys are winning everywhere. Because they are able to sell a fake a promise now we will destroy the, future, the real future. And that's the problem we need to face. By the way, in this example, it's a good example of what the Americans vote for Trump, but you need to remember that four years later, Trump was, went to election with the same speech about climate, and Biden went saying, no, I'm talking about works, I'm talking about jobs, I'm talking about growth, I'm talking about the new economy related with sustainable economy, and he won. Yes, a lot of factors there, but I, I go back to my point. It is possible, it is needed to build a narrative. We have not such a narrative, at least in less developed countries, and without it, it's going to be quite difficult to overcome the situation, and that's the reason why 50% of, of the of democracies are responsible by 50% of the emissions. The rulers are losing votes because they want to promise short-term solution where there are not short-term solutions. But, you know, here, I, I want to bring in both Nadia and Nisreen. Uh, one would think that one way to square this circle, this fiendishly difficult circle, is to bring young people into the process. I would think that it is young people that have the greater stake in what happens in the long run. So the question is, what is to be done to bring the voice of young people in a very active and prominent way into this discussion? I mean, if I were to give you a magic wand to each of you to create an institutional mechanism to bring the voice of young people into this debate, what would you do? I will have a long answer, so. <laughs> Sorry? I will have a long answer, so go ahead. <laughs> I think I already mentioned, you know, early on from having um, young people to engage young people, not only in, in, in discussions, but actually giving them the power to make decisions. I think uh, this is missing in a lot of uh, developing nations, um, nations in the global south, where youth voices are not being respected. And I, coming back earlier on the, what I just mentioned, the mechanisms that we should start on is definitely the education institution. So, yeah, that would be my really short answer, but really it's, it's a really complex issue. But I just want to comment on the, what Nisreen mentioned earlier about um, the, the uh, developed nations has more to lose. Um, the, the narrative um, is that it's really hard to talk about degrowth in developing nations than talking about degrowth in uh, privileged, na na mo most affluent nations. I mean, who would um, you know, make that decision in, in a developing nation to you know, 
to, to not having the kind of um, you know, development and etc. So it comes back to shared responsibility, you know, triple C, blah, blah, blah. So I really agree with your point, Ms. Reen. Um, Thank you, Nadia. Ms. Reen, if yes. I were to give you the, the magic wand <laughs> to include young people into this discussion in an active, prominent, visible way, what would you do? Um, a lot will disagree with me, but I don't think is inc inclusion is the problem. I think meaningful inclusion is the problem. We got to be invited to many panels, to many discussions, to many um, conferences. We gave speeches. They always have to have this young, diverse person to represent the youth in the panel. But then how far this panel goes, how far the recommendations from young people goes, how much investment the countries, the member states, the institutes are ready to put for young people, this is the actual question. I will give you a very live example, and I'm using Sweden here, so don't be nervous or sensitive about it. Currently, UN is, is doing a reform thing. So uh, they having our common agenda, and they proposed um, uh, to have a future generation envoy. We already have a UN youth envoy, so they proposed to have a generation, uh, future generation envoy. And they proposed also to have um, a UN youth office, just like a UN um, uh, women office, for example, no. or ILO, or any other UN offices, which is a, a separate streamlined body that actually works only for young people inclusion. The question is, let's say that UN said yes, member state voted that yes, we want this, we want that. Who's going to finance these two bodies? Who's going to finance the future generation office? And who's going to finance the UN youth office? The next question, how much influence this UN youth office and this future generation envoy will have on the big decision makings, like the Security Council, for example, um, how much influence they will have on the NATO, for example, you were talking about it earlier. I think in order to really, really include young people, we need to be ready that we will not have politics as usual, as you mentioned before. Why is that? Is because, first of all, we are in a stage now where young people are losing faith in the old mechanisms and the old institutes, which means that in order to restore this trust, we have to shake things a little bit. And also because we, are, we have a lot of big mandates, big um, um, missions, but then when it comes to the implementation, the impact of young people is very small comparing to the impact of big people, like not, not big, but let me see sen senior people. Um, I, I, I want to say something else. For example, you asked earlier if young people are willing to go to uh, politi politics. First of all, if I'm not sure how it's in Sweden, I hope it's better, but if, for example, in Sudan, if I run for election and another um, 55 years old man specifically run for election, he will get the automatic trust of the people just because of the age. And then they assume that age goes with experience. And the older you get, more experience you get, so you get the trust of the people that you can actually make the decisions for them. I can advise your campaign. <laughs> we, can, Perfect. We, we can turn that. <laughs> it's quite easy to defeat that. I argument. have a, a, a former yeah, yeah, president yeah. on my yeah, side. Yes, That's yes, perfect. Side. Like, we give you my credit card, my business, my, my credit card, my business, <laughs> my credit card as well. <laughs> That's my next step. <laughs> yeah, right. Who is going to finance? <laughs> <laughs> no, See, your subconscious sub talked about money because it's actually it's money matters. Uh, matters. Who's going to finance a youth led party? who's going to finance the campaigns, and how radical people can actually, I mean, not radical, uh, I mean extreme, but radical when it, when, in a positive way, yeah. that we can actually transform things to the other side, to the actual bright side, to the side that we think we deserve and we can actually live with. How radical can, can, can we be actually in that? And so when you talk about young people inclusion, then we are talking about financing, we are talking about support, we are talking about taking the stereotypes of older you get, more experience you get. It, it's true and somehow you have more experience in life, more trials of course, et cetera, et cetera, but also young people have experiences. Ms. Reed, so if I understand 
correctly, and, and not passing judgment on this. I mean, it, what you're saying is that all the incentives are aligned for you young people to shake up politics from the outside. That's what we're saying. Yeah, uh, but let me, let me, so let me give my point here. Little. And then first, we open it up to the public. First, I, 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 need, a very lively I need to be honest. I, I never in my life I have seen a square circle. Right. I never in my life I had seen a, a magic wand. So that kind of things <laughs> don't exist. So there is not. However, let's say I agree with you. And the point is, first, new generations are much more conscious, and in some countries, absolutely conscious about environmental responsibility. And it, it, from that point of view, it's a matter of time to revert politics in favor of the environment. Second. Uh, I agree with you in the sense that participation in politics, straightforward, could change the equation. And, and honestly, there are young people participating in several parts of the world. I believe that you, are, you look very young, Secretary Steve. I don't know how old are you, but you look very young. But I believe, I'm sure that here in Sweden, Norway, though, a lot of very responsible countries, more young people participate, active and, passive, and passively. Third, uh, it is important to think in a different way in terms of political participation. I believe that all the prejudice related with participation, with expertise, with the old politician, could be break quite easily if there is a common decision. And fourth, maybe we need to redesign some mechanism of democracy. For instance, where is the participation of youth people everywhere? It's in the mobile phones. It's in their social nets. And if we will allow that, not Twitter because it's quite aggressive, it's the jungle, that part. I, I, I like that jungle, but anyways, I don't recommend it anyway. If the political decision could be done in social nets, meaning regulating the right participation on the votes and the candidacies, meaning allowing young people who on daily basis and minute basis participate on that, Maybe we can change all these things related with the environment. If the public decisions are made not in the traditional way of casting votes polls, but in the, in the mobile phones, and the youth people could participate in politics that way, maybe some things could change. That's a very interesting, small very question. interesting thing. Small <laughs> question. Very small. Just yeah, to, please. To, yeah. please. And then we really have to, I mean, we have like 10 more minutes for uh, uh, My question is the for public. the audience themselves, so don't worry. OK. Uh, just to make my point even more clearer, who of you heard of the G20? <laughs> Who of you saw or hear or participated in any of the youth G20? When I was really young when I organized one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Okay. Prehistory? Pre no, no, no. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Th that's my point. No one of the audience heard but, of But it's not about participating in formal uh, international groups or bureaucracies, to be honest. It's breaking a yeah, leg in, is, in each country. Thing, I mean, I, I find this, this, this idea of, and it's a broader point that goes beyond climate change, of course, and beyond the climate crisis. I mean, we, we really have to rethink the way democratic politics works. And, to, to make it attractive for young people because there's nothing more uncool than the traditional vehicles of democratic politics. But it's needed to participate, definitely. I agree with that. There is no other way. Anyway. I think there's a lot of energy on the part of Indeed. young people. It's just that, you know, they, 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 as far as I can tell, they dislike the traditional vehicles of politics. Let's open it up. To the, to the public. I don't know if there are questions from the audience. That I see a few hands up. Uh, yeah, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Maybe we can group them together in the yeah, interest let's of take, time. Let's take, say, three. Um, so like, let me start with you. Hi, uh, I'm Eva Kosche. I'm a part of Fridays for Future Sweden. Um, and I have a question for Marcus Nilsson. Um, you s today, there was a report launched. And one of the principles of CPRI's report is think fast, think ahead, act now. And this is actually calling for immediate action. However, in the beginning, you were saying that we 
should not rush, which obviously opposes this idea. And I'm wondering what can change your mind if it is not science, if it is not a report like CPRI's, like the IPCC report that tells politicians to change, to start, to act now. So Thank how you. do we get it right fast? Um, that's the question. In There's the another back. one in the back. Thank you, Anna Tervartila from the Bank of Ideas, uh, Finnish think tank. I was actually, my question is more or less identical because clearly we're doing it too slow and wrong at the moment. So what is that right that we need to do? Um, and then this was related to, because I myself, I'm quite afraid of the upcoming resistance. If I think of the resi resistance to, for example, the COVID measures that we saw and, and the measures that climate change will need will be so much more, one could say even drastic. And, and if I think of the, the complaints or somehow the, the alarm of the high, high energy prices currently ongoing due to um, various reasons now including the, the war in Ukraine. I mean it's not like energy prices are going down in the near future so how will we actually take some of the crises that we have seen in the um, not so far past and learn from them for the future and how do we manage for example um, I don't know, um, yeah, the, the resistance that we will see for the needed uh, policy changes that we need to actually implement really fast and now. Thank you. One more question from the other side. Anybody? <coughs> Did anybody have their hand up? Let me come over there. Thanks very much. I'm Erin McCandless from Wits University in South Africa, and um, beautiful presentations, all of you, and interventions. Um, I was very taken by uh, President uh, Calderon's uh, intervention and discussion around uh, fear-based narratives, and my own parents voted for Trump, um, which has been an ongoing source of conflict in our family. Um, but I'm curious what you know, when, it, when, I, when we, my mother and I finally began to really get at the Your essence... Your mother what? <laughs> when I began to finally get at the essence of her, her resistance to talking about the environment, it was exactly about fear, and the fear was uh, just that it was too overwhelming. She felt she couldn't possibly do anything, and it was such an overwhelming challenge. So I'm curious how you might respond to that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Great questions. I mean, look, the first two ultimately go to one of the issues at the heart of this discussion, which is how do we act within the confines of democracy in a speedy way? So the problem is there is no speedway in democracy, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, you're sorry. There is no speedway in democracy. No. It's, it's a blocking role all the time. It's, it's, uh, uh, so the, the question is, how could you mobilize, persuade, mobilize people, voter resources, Congress, Congresses, to take action in the right direction? And it's, it, it requires a lot of politicians, maybe more youth people participating very aggressively, but in the formal channels, electing representatives, I don't know. And take the opportunity about fears and overwhelming thing. I remember a conversation, don't quote me because this, it created me, it created me a lot of political problems. But, uh, once I was discussing with some radicals, as you were saying, saying what exactly we all know, no? We have no time, the window of opportunity is almost closed. Uh, if you, we don't act this year, it's going to be impossible to reach the minus 1.5, etc., etc. A lot of etc., yet yes, are overwhelming. But if you continue kicking the same stone, we continue uh, drilling in the same hole, we are paralyzing the people that we can mobilize, in my opinion. So when we were discussing with this guy, well, if you tell me that the world is going to end in one year, or you tell me the world is going to end tomorrow, I will tell you, well, for, year. forget about the action. Let's go to the bar. Yeah. And that's the best thing we can do. <laughs> But, so we need to, to change the, the, the way in which you can mobilize what is possible to mobilize. What, the game is how to increase the probabilities to survive. Honestly, I believe it's going to be almost impossible or impossible to reach 1.5 Celsius. 
all, all, with the exception if technology can go all the way to change the equations in one decade and CCS and other mechanisms could help us and the cavalry could be in, her, in its way. However, whatever could be the real probabilities we have, we need to do whatever can do, we are moral obligated to persuade people with the right message. And the right message for me is not paralyze everyone. It's not send everyone just to abandon the task. It's to say there is a hope and you can do a difference in that hope. Before I go to you, um, Secretary Nelson, I mean, uh, again, to, uh, to Nadia and, and Ms. Rehm, uh, what's the narrative? I mean, since, mm -hmm. as President Calderon and others have said, it's so crucial to mobilize mm -hmm. people around this issue so as to put pressure on policymakers, what's the narrative that can mobilize young people in great numbers? Mm -hmm. Right, I'd like to, in response to your, um, your response and also your question, I think the narrative that we have right now is just survival. We are moving on survival mode, but people want to listen to more than survival, we want to thrive in the future. So that is the narrative that is missing. And the kind of discussions, narratives that we have in the Global South um, is, is of, of course centered on those, but the power, uh, what is missing is the power of journalism, the tools that is needed to disseminate this information. I think um, journalism has a really great, uh, amazing venue, and uh, most of the journalists right now is only writing about, um, you know, doom and gloom, and we've seen, um, you know, the news coming out from, from, you know, news media from the South has always been about, um, you know, whether it's fair, uh, how, how uh, why is it unfair for, for, for the global south to take up the, the, the you know, uh, the, the biggest um, uh, climate impacts and the worst of climate impacts. I think the climate journalism is absolutely critical and um, it should definitely include hope in the way that it explains about this complex issues and matters, we can't just move on doom and gloom, definitely not. And as a civil society, coming from a civil society perspective, hope is absolutely critical. We can't move without, you know, without having hope in mind. That's the only thing that we have. Yeah. Ms. Rim. To build on what um, Nadia mentioned, yes, and also uh, President Felipe, there is a hope. We have to have a hope. But we have to have milestones, targets, and goals mm -hmm. that we know that we are actually reaching these targets and goals and milestones with this hope. Otherwise, mm -hmm. hope becomes an illusion. Mm -hmm. If you have a hope of something that will ne never happen or is not happening, mm -hmm. then this is an illusion. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the lady's question. Why are we not reaching the targets that we are putting ourselves to ourselves in the same speed that we actually promise it? why it take, it's taking longer to actually reach there. And the answer is simply very, very simple. There's a lot of interest involved. Huge amount of capital, huge amount of market, huge amount of development. And we need to be honest to ourselves also as a climate activist. We will not wake up one day and find that everything turned to green because there's a whole system that took hundreds of years. I mean, when did we have the industrial revolution? 18th, uh, 19th century, I guess. So it took a, a century to reach this point. And I don't think it will take two days to actually move from this to green. But at least we have to have milestones and targets that we actually reach. And to your second point, I just want to remind uh, uh, President Felipe that he promised to give me his credit card. <laughs> well, yeah. For the record, <laughs> if you, if you, are, you are a candidate, no, the ball no, is in your side. The agreement was not no, like no, this. No, 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 yes, 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 you say that. No, you say that. Yes. Um, but, but the question here is also why we are trying to say fancy things that's very simple in a very dip diplomatic way. A lot of people call it environmental anxiety, and that's the lady from South Africa question. 
we uh, hear things very negative, we get very afraid, so we don't take action. This is the, the environmental anxiety. But from my perspective, it's called environmental reality. If we are actually realizing that we are doing a lot of things that's not actually impacting the process, then we don't lose hope, we don't go to the bar or the Bahamas and wait. I, don't aff aff I cannot afford going to the Bahamas anyway. To the what? <laughs> Bahamas. <laughs> Bahamas? Yes. Um, no, it's a joke, a it's a joke that young people should go to the Bahamas and celebrate by the beach until the world burns. Right, no. I'll <laughs> about the bar in the hotel. Or yeah. Cancun. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Good. Um, but the idea that we need to keep honest and true to ourselves and have a scoring board. Yes, we are moving to carbon neutral by 2030, and this needs to means that we need to have all public transportation electric by X. And electric by X doesn't mean that we go to Congo, uh, Congo or Liberia and take lithium and legally from there just to build batteries to, 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 to turn green, because this is not a green, this is actually destroying other countries' uh, uh, nation. So it, it's, it's not an easy process, we understand that, but we at least need to see that we, are, we have a plan and we are moving according to that plan. And I think this is why people, young people are frustrated. We have hundreds of plans, but we don't think that we are moving according to the plan that we are having. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to that point, I mean, your, your first, uh, first comment reminded me of one of the things that one of my mentors used to say, that we don't need wishful thinking, we need thoughtful wishing. That's true. Right? Secretary Nielsen. Uh, no, no, I just want to, uh, I think, Ms. Reen, you put it very uh, well. I agree with almost everything you said in this last remark and what you said before as well. I think, let's be frank, it's moving too slow. Yes, yeah, it's easy. It is. We should be moving quicker. That's completely true, but the problem is that there are interests. There are interests in so many ways, and some of these interests are quite legit. Uh, I would say it is hard to look someone in the eye and say, I'm sorry, you're out of work tomorrow, we have to shut down your factory. That's very hard. It's hard to tell somebody a negative, uh, uh, some negative news without putting forward what do we do instead. And this is both the curse of democracy, but also the strength of democracy. If done correctly, we can actually present another possibility, another road forward. It will take a little bit more time, because if we don't do it correctly, then there will polit be politicians the next day saying, you know what, let's not do anything. Let's just not do it. Let's do nothing. And that's the balance that we're trying to strike. That doesn't mean we move slow, but it does mean we have to include people who will be affected by the choices politicians make. Because if we don't, we will be voted out, we should be voted out, and we will be replaced by something else. So I think that the strength of democracy, and that might be, since we're running over time, be my last point, that the strength of democracy is that there will always be interests, no matter what kind of government you have, but democracy's strength is it can balance interests, it can find a solution, it can build a better tomorrow. No other way of governing can. President Calderon, your final point. Yeah, very well, quickly. like I said, I'm really concerned about the issue about the speed. Let's say uh, uh, if we are driving, it's to put like a full speed, full throttle in the pedal. However, the car in democracy doesn't react that way. In me, my particular cases, because I had no majority in Congress. So that's a clear block to any will you have in order to change quickly. And the, you have voters that simply disagree about you. You have a skeptical or climate deny people who vote as well. So we need to persuade and mobilize in democracy all those interests. The bad thing with dictatorship is once you have a dictator with is completely against responsibility in climate, he is able to destroy everything. He's able to lock down 300 hectares of mangrove in order to build a refinery, which is happening now in Mexico. So that kind of things are exactly the, the ups and downs of, the, or, or, of democracy. The, you want to go all the way speed, 
350 kilometers per hour, but you have a very small, very old car that is unable to do that. Actually, uh, it combo, uh, internal combustion engine, by the way, so this is not. So that democracy is that not because we want to be slow. It is because we need to face a lot of obstacles, and it's not easy. We need to learn to be better politicians, more successful politicians, and maybe the young people could do that because they are a massive amount of voters that are not participating a lot. I have a question. Ms. Freeman. We You're invest free. the system to work for us, or we invest the system to work for the system? No, no. Well, what, which system? The general. Let, let, let's assume there is a democracy. Yes. If the people don't participate, voting, promoting, organizing political parties, yes, a very small group of people are going to take the same decision, serving the vested interests. Yes. The democracy works. The more people participate with new vision, new generation, more conscious about the environment, the situation will change. So uh, my point is, we have a lot of phrases in politics that it's time to leave those phrases away and think seriously and pragmatically what we can do. So I would support your campaign if you run for president. <laughs> Ms. Rim, your final point in 30 seconds. Systems change, climate doesn't change. We should change the system, not the climate. Great point, great point. <laughs> 30, 30 seconds. <laughs> First of all, I think democracy is more than just electoral po politics um, because what I've been seeing in, in Global South Nations, we keep on voting the same people over and over again. So I, it, in my opinion, some democracies, the younger ones can be bought and can be derailed by this information and we have to be careful on that. So from my perspective as a civil uh, society representative here, um, we have to mobilize more than electoral politics. We have to increase political participation, and that means mobilizing communities, empowering young people, um, giving you know, spaces for people to speak, and their decision-making uh, are accounted for, and the fundings that you just mentioned. So those, I think, are political participation. It's more than just political parties. So this is something that uh, we need to think about. And tell Sweden yeah, thank to finance the youth, the youth office, <laughs> <laughs> the UN youth office. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> but for what? What do you want to be an office in the United Nations? I don't, I don't know. Just try We are already Why? over time. I mean, you, we can continue the discussion uh, <laughs> later. There's so much to discuss. And thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, mm. Let me just yeah. say that the main the main takeaway that I get from this is really, I mean, I'm of course, I'm looking at this through the perspective of democracy, which is my business, I guess. Um, we need to rethink democracy uh, for, 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 for the future and for the new generation. The good news is that if what we need is popular mobilization, if what we need is popular pressure, if what we need is popular participation, democracy is much, much better at making that possible than any other political arrangement. It's not inevitable, but it's certainly in a better position to make sure that that happens than any other kind of political system. And let me just finish by saying that I think personally that we owe it to the to the next generation and to the ones after that to save the planet and to save democracy. And we have to be able to walk and tweet at the same time. So I'm thank there. you so very much. Let's give a round of applause to our wonderful speakers. And thank you all for being here and let the program continue Good. now. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you.